Thank you guys for joining us. Sean Foyt here with Hold the Line, and I am having the pleasure of sitting with Senator Josh Hawley, who is so, I'm so excited you're here. Oh, we're, thank you. we're, in a, we're in my man cave office, and we are here to really share, <laughs> really share about uh, just some things on our heart as we approach this crazy season, this cultural war. Yeah. We're believers, we're Christians. We want to hold the line, yeah. which, by the way, what, what does that mean to you when you hear that? Well, I mean, I think, I think as a believer, first and foremost, it means standing up for the gospel of Jesus Christ right. and not being apologetic about that and not being afraid to say that I'm a follower of Jesus, you yeah. know, and that that's, that's the most important thing Come to on. me and that's the most important thing in my life. And by the way, that's the most important thing in, in, in anything that we'll do, whether it's mm -hmm. politics or whether it's business or anything else, saying that I'm a follower of Jesus, I love the Lord, I want to have his purpose for my life, I want to, I want to honor his purpose for my life. If you're called to, to government, I want to do that. I want to honor him in government. If you're called to, to the arts, I want to honor him in the arts. If you're called to, uh, to business, I want to honor him in business. To me, that's when you talk about holding the line as believers, that's the most important line to hold. Amen, yeah. 100%. We're, we're coming out of a crazy election. Yeah. We're coming into a season where... I mean, I don't. I would have never imagined the intensity and the attacks of this current administration on Christians, on people of faith, yeah. on our children, on gender, on you know all the things. Um, I think what I wrestle with is this: okay, we have these issues. We need to have the mind of Christ. It's hard to not get riled up every day yeah. Yeah. when you see some new executive order or some new agenda. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk through some of those, but maybe just help us. How, how, what would your advice be right now in this season as we approach this time where we're coming off the election, yeah. we're dealing with the fact that this is our reality? Yeah. Well, I think as believers, I think the most important thing that we can do, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to pray. And we, we've, right. got to be, we've got to be folks who are looking to the Lord for direction, yeah. who are saying, Lord, you know, how would you have us engage? How would you have us carry a hopefulness right. into this season, because I think it's so easy to be discouraged. I mean, you look yes. at it, and you reference it. You look at the attacks on our religious liberty, our right to worship. You look at the attacks on, on women's sports, for instance. Some crazy stuff, right? right? I mean, really right. crazy stuff that's going on out there. And I think in the midst of that season, we have to say, all right, Lord, how are we going to carry the... I mean, we know how the story ends, right? Let's right. put it that yeah, way. Yeah, like, yeah, in a year totally. with a lot of news... We've got the best news. The right. best news is, is that Jesus died for our sins. He's going to come back. Um, he's present with us now by his Holy Spirit. So we've got hope for the future and also right. hope for the present. So how do we live out that hope now in a time of turmoil? Right. And how do we model for people, you know, we're coming off of COVID. How do we model for people in the midst of COVID where people are isolated, they're lonely, right. they are depressed, especially right. young people, they need, I think, the hope that we have to say, hey, there is hope for your future. You know, there is hope for your present and there's hope for what you can be. There's hope for the future. So I think getting into that headspace and then being honest about, yeah, we, we do face a lot of challenges right now. Yeah. And going back to hold the line, we've got to hold the line on those key critical issues, but we do it with a spirit of hopefulness. Right, 100%. And, and I think that it's... It causes what I've started to notice, even young people, is it causes them to to even disengage yeah. when they when they see the intensity of this season. It causes them to disengage, to withdraw, and I, I and this is one of the reasons why I feel so strongly and compelled to run with this narrative because when we disengage, when believers disengage, when yeah. we withdraw, there is no light permeating that region. That's right. And so, I mean, this is why I'm so grateful for you and others like you that the Lord has embedded into the, the mountain of government because you're, you're there, you're a hope carrier, you're a light bringer. Now, as we talk about that, yeah. we have real issues at the same time, yeah. you know, yeah. and things that, that we have to take a stand for, ways that we have to engage. Um, there's so many. I mean, I think we could just start number one with the attack on religious liberties, yep. attack on our freedom to worship. Of course, we've seen that exponentially increase during COVID. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've seen, uh, un unlike I would imagine in my lifetime, what, what are your thoughts on that? How do we 
Here's the fun. thing about COVID that I noticed that I think is is really worrisome, and as as believers, but also as as believers of the Constitution, you know, sort of followers of the Lord Jesus, but we also believe in our First Amendment. Right. And for for both of those reasons, we need to take a stand. Here's what I saw during COVID: an ex- incredible expansion of government power, and also an excuse to tr- treat the church differently than any other establishment. So we had lots of places around this country, unfortunately, where they would allow casinos to be open, right. bars to be open, strip you know, clubs. fine, strip clubs to be open, not churches. You know, and you'd have two sets of rules where you would have one set of right. rules for secular institutions, another set of rules for churches. I have sat in the Judiciary Committee in the United States Senate and listened to nominees for this present administration, unfortunately, talk about how the churches presented a unique challenge in COVID. Churches were somehow especially problematic. Yeah. You know, I pressed them on this and read their quotes back to them and said, how can you, our First Amendment says that you can't treat churches differently than you right. treat other institutions. In fact, our First Amendment actually talks about, and the Supreme Court has talked about, a special solicitude for churches. You know, there's lots right. of cases on that, the Hosanna Tabor case. So on, on this time, I think we've got to say loud and clear, hold on, hold on. Um, you cannot, the, the government cannot single out churches for disfavor. And they especially can't single out worship for disfavor. Mm-hmm. Christians are good citizens, you know. I mean, we want to we want to model good citizenship. Uh, I mean, look, you look at this past year and the number of churches that went out there in times of need, help right. helping people get yeah. food, helping people who were shut in. So we want to do all of that. We want to be good citizens, how we mm-hmm. model our behavior. But we also need to say we are essential. Worship is essential. Right. And by golly, we need to be treated. We're, we're going to say that if you're going to open up anything, you need to open up the church, and we need to we need to defend those freedoms. And it's really it's about the next generation. It's right. not you know COVID. Thankfully, is, is is getting behind us now, but we need to be concerned about the next generation. Right. Well, and I think you know we're in a state right now. We're sitting in a state where you know had the most difficult restrictions yeah. on churches and worship. And of course, this is probably why we had the energy that we did when, when we started doing these gatherings. Yeah. But there's been five Supreme Court cases now, yeah. you know, that have proven that the church, and now that, you know, the, the, the governor has to pay back the fines of some of my friends, you know, yeah. that stood up and sued the, the, the governor. Yeah. But it's been a divisive issue in the church, right? Because there, you, on one hand, you have people saying, well, we just need to, you know, Romans 13, they have yep. this interpretation. We just need to listen to governmental authorities. And then you have the other side that's saying, you know, and we really need to love our neighbor and we yep. can love our neighbor, which is, has always been kind of a weird thing for me to wrap my mind around how suicide rates, drug and alcohol are increasing, all these things. And we love our neighbor by not engaging with our neighbor. That's literally yeah. falling apart. But you have that narrative. So you have the Romans 13, you have that. And so you have this divide in the church, even in California, yeah. you know, uh, even in some of our, our own home churches, it's, yeah. it, there's a split. What, where, where do you, and then, I'm sorry, and then the other side, you have the people that are like, we need to fight for this. This is the church's essential book of Acts. Yep. You know, yep. got, you know, heaven itself even authorized two jailbreaks. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so right. how do you fit that in the context of Romans 13? Yeah. When they the the governors and authorities, God directly came against them, broke them free out of prison. Yep. Um, let's talk about that. Well, I think the Romans thirteen, I think, is the right place to be, and 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 yeah, we are commanded to have respect for the governing mm-hmm. authorities. We're we're commanded to be good citizens in that way. Right. Of course, now in the United States, we have a constitution that right. that is over all of those right. governing authorities, right. and that defines our rights and responsibilities as citizens. And I think part of what it means to be a good citizen in our context is to stand up for that constitution That's and to good. say, now, hold on now, really we, we've got to get back to That's the good. basics that unite us as Americans right. and that also that, that put in place the limits and parameters of right. our government. Because you know, something that we're not for, and you see this in scripture, I mean, you look at, you go to the book of Revelation, you look at, at, at a portrayal of a government there that is unlimited in its power, and you know, that's, that's an evil government. So a government yeah. that is unlimited, right. that can do whatever it wants, right. That's an evil government. That's right. not our government. Right. You know, our government is constitutionally defined. Right. What's the first words of the Constitution? We the people. Right. So I think in this time, we need, yeah, we need to love our neighbors. We need to be sensitive to people with health conditions. We need to be out there ministering to them, all of that stuff. But we also need to be saying that the First Amendment is vital. Worship is vital. Right. And we surely, as believers and also as Americans, we can take our stand there right. on that Constitution, on that that is the overarching premise of our government that holds yeah. our government together and say, 
this is what we believe in, and we want to see that honored. You, you reference the Supreme Court. The court's been pretty clear about this now. Yeah. I mean, multiple cases where the court has said, look, you can't treat churches and places of worship differently. And it's not just Christians, by the way. The Orthodox Jewish community in New right, York, right. well, you talk about getting targeted. Totally. Totally. I mean, where you had allegations that the governor redrew a, a map so that the Orthodox Jews, you know, it would just, it would, it would single them out. I mean, that's unconstitutional. Totally. That's unconstitutional, totally. yeah. which is basically what the Supreme Court yeah. said when they invalidated that. Right. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, this looks like what the what we call right. religious animus in the law. Right. So I think talking about citizenship, how do we be good citizens? Well, we stand up for our constitution. Right. And and we do it not just because like I demand my rights, I demand my rights. We we do it because Worship is vital because right. meeting together is yeah. vital. And because at the end of the day, we also have to think about what's this mean for the future. And the last thing I would say on this, Sean, is that there's a great line that I've always loved, which is that America didn't create religious liberty. Religious liberty created America. That's, that's in our DNA. Damn. It's who we are. It's who we are. That's good. Yeah. Wow. I that's wish I could really say good. it was my line, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love, you know, the, the last thing on that is, is I feel, um, you know, I've told people in, in my brief stint, uh, peeking behind the veil in the political realm, you know, in my run for Congress, I, you know, I noticed this spiritual dynamics, Yeah. right? Especially yeah. in this state where there is an agenda spiritually, right? A battle's not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but yeah. there's a spirit in that capital in Sacramento yeah that wants the church to shut up, mm -hmm. right? And they will mm -hmm. do anything they can. And that spirit is working through people, mm -hmm. you know, to accomplish that. And so I think that's a, a lot of times I try to help people understand, I'm like, listen, like you can't just say that these politicians or these people have the best, have the best thought in mind with the church. You have to actually look at them and go, why are they specifically targeting the church? Yeah. You know, well, it's because there is there is a thing right now in America that wants the church to shut up. Yeah. Wants the church to back, back down, wants the church to cow down, wants the church to comply. Right, that's you know, right. And we're starting to see that in many other areas. So there has to be a recognition of that, I think, as well. What is the agenda yeah. behind this? Well, I think that part of that is you've got this secular progressivism that has become really, really powerful. And unfortunately, on, on the left in our country, it, right. it's this idea that it, it really, it's, all, it's almost its own religion in a way, where right. um, it, it, it's hostile to Christian faith, it's hostile to faith in general. You go back to Orthodox Jews getting targeted. And what the secular progressives really want is they, they want to see the Christian influence in society reduced. They think right. that the church is a place of oppression, you right. know? I mean, the, the more candid among them will say that. We right. think the church is an oppressive institution. We think Christianity is an oppressive faith. Right. We wanna see, we don't want Christians really engaged as Christians in public life. We don't want them doing adoptions. We don't want them uh, 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 running homeless shelters. You know, we don't want them engaged in that kind right. of life unless it's on our terms 100%, right. totally. you know? Unless they basically renounce their, their gospel convictions. So I think you've got that ideology out there and it's right. really powerful and it, it has more and more adherence, mostly on the right. left. I don't think it's shared by the American people, but it's powerful. And I think for a lot of folks, what we saw in COVID is a lot of, a lot of folks like, you know what, the church, you know, we, these people, they're, they're, they're dangerous anyway. So, and now they want to worship during a pandemic and they want right. we need to close <laughs> right. them down. You right. know right. I mean? Totally. We need to close them down. Totally. The fact that so many Christians would say, hey, actually, no, Meeting together is essential. Worshiping is essential. Right. I think that for a lot of progressive secularists, they're like, yeah, that just confirms what we always thought about you all, which is that, you know, you're, you're a danger to society. And that's right. why we need to use the power of government. Right. To squash. To, 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 yeah, exactly. To clamp down on this. And that's why worship is particularly yeah, dangerous, totally. some of them said. In fact, the opposite is true. The Constitution says the opposite is true. Worship is especially protected. Right. And it is yeah. because there's something, the opposite of the secular progressive ideology is I think the belief system that undergirds our constitution, right. which is that, you know what? The right of conscience is vital to who we are. It's what right. makes us free. Our ability right. to follow the call of God on our life, to discern it for ourselves, right. not the government, to discern it for ourselves and to follow it peacefully, but to follow that call in our lives. That's what makes us free. That's what gives us our unique character in many ways as Americans, mm -hmm. and that's why our Constitution protects it. And so the, I, I come back to the fact that's what we've got to be strong for. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing too is, is we're you know we're coming up on hundred cities you know that we've yeah. been to since yeah. in the last nine months. So I don't know, and you know, there may be some out there, but I doubt there's 
been anyone that's gone to more communities and touched more cities than we have, especially places of, you know, like Portland and yeah. Chicago and yeah. Seattle and places of trauma and strife and Minneapolis. Yeah. And what I begin to notice is, is that the church really has a mandate and a call to bring healing in these times, Amen. right? Yeah. So, Amen. I mean, take, take, take the race issue, take the unrest, you yes. know. When we gathered in a place like Minneapolis, yeah. we were there a couple weeks ago, and we're, you know, a block away from where the, some of the worst writing was. They were about to burn this church down. And we show up as a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, yeah. you know, multi-denominational group of people. And we say, we're going to stand for peace. We're going to stand for unity. Yeah. We're going to do, if we're, if, if we're going to do reconciliation together, we're going to do it here, yeah. you know, and it's going to be the church that leads the way. And what we've seen is that when the church has responded and engaged and not hid in their homes, yeah. right? And, and at the same time, we've had to fight the narratives of, oh, you're just trying to steal the limelight of the oppressed, whatever. But when we get together with, you know, you know, black, Hispanic, white, Asian leaders, it's powerful yeah, to bring unity and change. It and it actually squashes this narrative that so many people believe that we're so divided. It, yeah. It's like we're not as divided, first of all, as they want to make us seem. That's right. But when the church shows up and brings unity and brings healing, we've seen cities shift, man. Yeah. You Amen. Know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think what you've been doing and the ministry you've been doing is so powerful in that way. I remember a video from a, a rally that you did, Sean, last year in which I think it was a, a, a young gal and a police officer, young African-American woman, a police officer, yeah. memory serves. But, you know, where, where he's, he's there... And he's there, I think, just to just to provide security at the rally. But he goes over to her and gives her a hug and is like, "Hey, we're we're, it, we're going to get through this together." Yeah. So powerful, yeah. right? So yeah. genuine, yeah. so powerful. Totally. Yeah. So to see that kind of healing happen right. and that kind of unity, I think, is amazing. I think there are, you know, there are forces in the country, and I think this this critical theory, critical race theory, yeah. this sort of the, the crit theory, is it sometimes called. It really thrives on division. I mean, we right. should be honest about totally. that, you know. Yeah. And the, and the, the totally. woke, all the whole woke right. ideology, it thrives on division. It thrives on saying that America is an inherently oppressive place. That our systems, our system of government, our system of culture, our language, yeah. uh, certainly our our uh, churches, all of those are inherently oppressive and inherently divisive. And the only way to do something about that is, is to basically go and challenge them and to, to tear them down, metaphorically speaking, and, and replace them. You know what I mean? To, to try and, and deconstruct the culture right. and rebuild it in a completely different way. That's a very divisive, it's meant to be divisive. Right. I think that ideology is it's not biblical. Well, and it's crept into the church. Yeah, it has. I mean, it's, 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 it's hardcore in the church right now. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think, you know, we've got to be clear-eyed about that. And we've also got to, in a winsome, but also in a firm way, go out there and say, actually, that's not true. You know, it's not true. America's not a systemically racist place. It's not systemically evil. Is it imperfect? Yeah, of course. Of course, yeah, absolutely it is. You read our history, you see it's imperfect. You can look around and see it's imperfect. It's, yeah. it's inhabited by people. I mean, are, is the church right. imperfect? Yeah, it is. You know, is there sin in the church? Yes, of course there is. But that is a very different proposition from saying that, all of these systems are inherently oppressive right. yeah. and they've got to be deconstructed. What we need to do is not deconstruct, we need to build. What we need to do is not divide, but to unify. Right. I think what we need is not, is not to call out into shame, but to heal. Right. And this is why the ministry you're doing is so powerful because it calls people to healing yeah. and to reconciliation uh, and, and ultimately to move forward together. And I think that's, that's really powerful. Wow. So as we approach these issues, like people in the church, young people specifically, they get caught up in critical race theory and just the woke yeah. culture. Yeah. And I know we say jokes about it, we don't, but it, but it's a real thing. I mean, it's it like it's yeah. like a it's it's like a, a virtue signaling, like who's the wokest among us? Because you care the most, obviously. Right. Or right. or you know, I mean, and when it comes to critical race theory, you know, which really exploded in the aftermath of you know, what happened in Minneapolis yeah. with George Floyd. And then, yeah. you know, what is your, how do you talk to believers about combating this? Well, I think we got to take our stand. As believers, we got to take our stand on the scripture. And we can't right. allow anything else to, I mean, the word of God, I'll just say my own personal conviction, the word of God is our, our, guy, is our foundation, our anchor, our light, our truth. I mean, that is, as a believer, that's how right. we evaluate the world and reality because that is the ultimate reality. Right. I think you look at critical race theory and you look at these other critical theories that go along with the kind of offshoots of postmodernism, 
These theories, are, they don't come from a biblical place. Right. Uh, listen, I, I, I will just say this. Uh, anybody who wants to work for justice, I think that's a great end. Right. Nobody, I mean, you want to talk about justice? Who is the ultimate justice seeker of all time, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You know, who has been, the, what has been the greatest force for justice in our world? It's the church of Jesus Christ. Right. So we see no ground on that. You know, I mean, if, if you want to talk about justice, right. you want to talk about healing and wholeness, right. that's the church's mission, absolutely. Right. But critical theory, I think what it does is, is it comes in and it says, our culture is inherently oppressive. These cultural right. systems are inherently right. oppressive. And we can, you know, we can, we can build, we've got to deconstruct all of those and then we can build a new society and if you look at it, you know, critical theory regards Christianity as an oppressive religion, Very, oh, of course. you know, and says that in some well, of the- Well, it's, it's Marxist roots. It, there's a lot of Marxism, like right. cultural Marxism. Right. Is called, there's a lot of that there in, in critical theory, a lot of that there. And, you know, I think we've got to, as believers, we've got to be open, we've got to be clear-eyed again about where this is coming from, where critical theory is coming from, and say that in many ways it's a replacement. It's trying to be right. a replacement for the call to healing, the call to service, right. the call to justice that we find in the scripture. So I would just say to, to, to young believers out there who are they're concerned about justice, I would say amen to that. And they say, well, what, how do we find a program for justice? I would say you look at the scripture yeah. and you look there what the Lord yeah. calls us to. You look at, I mean, here, to me, Sean, here's the, as a believer, why do we believe in unity and healing? You look at, in the New Testament, you look at the testimony of Jesus who says that, right. that, that the salvation of Jesus Christ is available for all people, right. that the Holy Spirit is poured out on all people. That for us is our mandate, that that's why we don't believe in racial division, we right. don't believe in class division, right. we don't believe in, in ethnic division, we don't believe in that because we believe that, that the call to Jesus comes to everybody, right. that he loves everyone, that the Spirit can be poured out on all. You know? right. So I would say to young people, take your stand on that. That's our mandate right there. Right. And then you push on from there in a way that loves and honors all people. I love that. And, and, re, and, and also regarding the, the woke narrative, the pushing yeah. of, of well, give me just a little bit on that. What would your... I just think that the, I think we've got to be careful with, with so much of the woke narrative is about, um, it's, a, it's, it's sort of performance and it's about, well, how can I make myself look Appear better, better yeah, of course. than other people? And there's a major shaming element to it. You know, and I would just say as believers, you gotta be careful about this. Like uh, shaming other people in order to make yourself look better, that's not biblical. Yeah. You know, that's not of the Lord. They, you know, when, when we see you know, evil and injustice, we're gonna call right. that out. Yeah, but you know, I mean, repentance gotta begin with the household of God. So I think that you, you look at yourself and you're like, whoa, I mean, I'm, I'm not a perfect. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm a sinful person. I need the Lord's forgiveness. I'm not going to go out and shame and condemn other people right. in order to make myself look better. And I think so much of the woke uh, religion, in a way, is that it, it wants to create, um, it, has, it has its, it's own. It's a works-oriented it is. religion. Totally. Yeah. That's exactly the right way to say it. It really is. And you see this with, you know, you remember the videos from Washington, D.C. of a year ago where you've got these crowds of people who are trying to get white people to get down on their knees and you know, raise their hands and repent of, of being white and so on. That looks a lot like Christianity, except for you've removed Jesus, you've removed the gospel, right, right, you, right. you know? So it's, it's, right. it is a, it is a works right. of man there. So, you know, if you've got sin in your life, yeah, you want to repent of it, but we're not going to allow anything to stand in the place of Jesus. Come on. We had several moments in, uh, on our videos in, in different cities where we have, you know, African-American leaders, right? Preaching the gospel, yeah. leading white, angry BLM protesters to Jesus. Yeah. Happened numerous yeah. times. Yeah. And it was awesome. powerful to yeah. see that the gospel is, is what levels the playing field. Yeah, totally. Like we all need Jesus, you yeah. know? And I, but I think that what I've noticed is that there's, it's a works oriented thing, but then there's a lot of offense and anger. Yes. And entitlement that's wrapped up in that. Yes. And I just feel like it it causes hearts to grow hard. It's causing people to leave the church. They're blaming the church because the church isn't woke enough. Yeah. And there's this, really, I think at the end of the day, there's this pressure for the church to look like the world, to yeah. look like these corporations, yeah. you know, that right. are right. Right. pushing this woke narrative. Right, yeah, the corporations, you know, this is my favorite song. These are the corporations that have, hollowed out whole communities in this country. You know, I mean, they have sent jobs overseas, good paying jobs, working class jobs, sent those overseas, all to make a buck, hollowed out communities in the urban core as well. You know, why is it that a lot of folks in the urban core can't get good jobs? 
These corporations have been happy to send those jobs overseas, but now they say, oh, but, 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 don't hold us accountable because we're woke, you know, yeah. and we'll give money to this group or that group, uh, and other, you know, but let us do what we want. You know, we want to send your jobs to China. We want to import cheap stuff from China. You know, we're going we're gonna to deindustrialize America, but, but we're woke, you know, we're okay. I, I think that we need to actually, you, you, you want to talk about, I mean, on the flip side of works, I mean, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. I'd say to some of these corporations, why don't you show me your works? I mean, a totally. lot of talk. Totally. Why don't you bring some totally. jobs back to the urban core? Why don't you bring some jobs back to, to rural America? Why don't you actually, why don't you do that? You know, but to your point just about in the church, I think the woke religion is a religion of anger. It's a religion right. of anger and division. And, it, and, it, and it's premised on the idea that again, there is oppression everywhere, that even if you're not aware of it, if you belong to a dominant group, right. if you're a Christian, if you're white, if you're a male, you are an oppressor. Um, and, and it constantly pits Americans and people against each other right. like that. The problem is that there's no space in that, in that religion for forgiveness. Totally. There's no space 100%. for healing. Yeah. There's no space for growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, where does that leave you? It leaves you angry and it leaves you wanting to tear everything down where we need to be about building. And it also and it also gives this mass blanket of, uh, you know, even for my African-American friends, they're like, I don't buy into that victim thing. Yeah. You know, like I don't buy, I, in fact, actually, or, or minorities. So my family, we celebrated Memorial Day uh, with, um, with a, a friend of ours. It's a contractor from the Bay Area. He, he helped us remodel our kitchen when we had a pipe that broke. And I was sitting down with him. And he's from Honduras. Yeah. And he's we're sitting down here in his cabin on this lake. He has a boat. He has a house in San Francisco. And he's like, you know, 16 years ago, I was in Honduras. Mm. And I had a, every time a storm would start, I would have a river that came through my hut. Yeah. And he's like, I'm here in America. Yeah. I have a family. Yeah. You know, I have, it's like, Nobody can tell me this is not a great country. Yeah. Nobody can tell me this is not a place of opportunity. And I feel like a lot of that narrative tries to do is, is it prohibits people from actually stepping in and accessing all that they can get in yeah. this country. Yeah, that's all right. All the opportunity. Yeah, I think it's right. Know, um, it also prevents us, by the way, from moving forward because you look at it in our history. T take Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. King, for example. What, what, did, what did Dr. King do? He called Americans to be the best of who we could be. And he looked back at our history and he said, you remember the commitments we made as Americans to each other. You look at our Declaration of Independence. You look what this nation was founded on. We share that together. We need to live up to that together. He didn't look back and say, America is an irredeemably right. racist and evil nation. Let's just start, not at all. He said, America has made these commitments we need to take them seriously. Let's live up right. to that together as Americans. And that bound people together and it galvanized the nation. It woke up a nation. Really? It changed this country. And I worry that so much, again, this critical theory, the woke stuff, by declaring America evil, by saying our history needs to be basically erased, you you ruin the ability to bring people together to, together to inspire them and then to have real change. Because, right. you know, there's what what we share as Americans is our history. What we share as Americans is, is, our, is our shared beliefs and our basic foundational principles. And if you'd say that, no, those are no good, that's all corrupt, how are you gonna unite Americans and call them to something more? And I think that's one of the challenges of our day. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. No, you're you're totally right. I mean, they're there and and you gotta see the storyline God is writing. Yeah. You know, so when when I grew up on the East Coast, you know, I was we we lived about nine miles from where the first cross was planted on the shores. Yeah. You know, there in Cape wow. Henry. Yeah. And, you know, they fasted and prayed on the boat and then came across. And sure, I mean, there was so much that was not right, but the the intention and the storyline of God yeah. on this nation. That's what I have to draw people back to. Yeah. God's writing a story, you know. I mean, you're talking to we're talking right now. I didn't give a rip about America years ago. I was yeah. in the nations 20, 30 times a year. And then the Lord really told me to focus for the future of my children. Mm. You know, what are we leaving our children? What's the legacy? Yeah. And I think that's why these conversations are so necessary to engage in the church, you know, because you got this, you know, not no longer education, you got indoctrination, yeah. you know, in schools. You yeah. got churches that are losing the plot, critical race theory. You have, you know, this this woke thing covering America. Uh, you know, you have big tech, which yep, we need to talk right. about, yep. you know, which is yep. a force. They are. Oh, you know, yeah. and, Powerful force. And we're a couple hours north of them. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. and and 
you know, we were talking earlier, you know, California has a $78 billion surplus this court because of big tech. Yeah. Yep. They've just raked it in over COVID. And really, in my estimation, increased their power in totally. the COVID era. Absolutely. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. No, big tech has gotten more powerful during this time. And, you know, and Josh wrote an incredible book about big tech, by the way. Everyone's got to get it. But share with us your insights, man. You've, you've, you've done a deep dive into this. Well, I would just, my view about the, about the big tech companies is this, is that they want to control how we talk. They want to control what we say. They want to control the news and information also. I mean, this should be scary to people. It's not just that they want to censor your speech, although they do, as you found out. You know, and others who, have, who, who want to talk about Jesus, pro-life groups, you right. know, constantly— but it's not just that. They also want to control what we read, how, how journalism, how news is written in America. And I talk about this some of the book. They've done all those things. How can they do it? Because they've achieved monopoly status right. over communication in this country. Right. That's why I think they need to be broken up. I mean, my view is in this country, we don't allow monopoly corporations right. to control our economy, to control our government, right. to control our speech. We don't allow it. We never have allowed it. We shouldn't allow them to do it. So we ought to break them up. There ought to be more competition and, and we, ought to give, we ought to give the American people control back instead right. of big tech. But big tech has become a major proponent of this woke agenda, absolutely, right. of a left-wing, secular, progressive agenda. Right. I think that's because their executives believe it. Uh, right. Probably many of the folks who totally. work for them believe it. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't matter to them that half or more of the country right. doesn't believe it. Boy, they're going to enforce it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, listen, it's America. They're private companies. If they want to have a point of view, fine. But what they shouldn't be able to do is kill competition Prevent there from being any choice in expression. And have no consequences. And have no consequences. Right. Well, and and I'm sure you guys may have seen, if you haven't, Google it. You can see Josh grilling Zuckerberg, grilling Jack Dorsey, all these guys in the Senate. They're great videos. But you really, man, like you, so I believe, speaking over you, that, you know, you have a prophetic thing about you. And so you were really early on the big tech thing before it became a thing. And you were raising your voice, waving your flag. They're saying, we got to address this. We got to address this, you know. Uh, And I was right there with you. Now, that was even before I experienced them censoring, blacklisting, removing our posts, removing our worship videos, which are so dangerous. Yeah. And, 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 And really pushing us down in a lot of ways. Um, that was before that. I could sense that you had something, right? Like, and I feel like, by the way, it's kind of a hold the line thing, kind of a Sean thing. I feel like the Lord gives prophetic insight to leaders to know, hey, this is coming. I want to give you direction and a, and a strategy. And it just feels like to me like you had that. We haven't actually even talked about this, but I felt like you had that back before anyone else did. How did that happen? What was your insight? And what was the alarm that kind of went off? Well, it really, for me, it started when I was Attorney General of the state of Missouri. So in okay. 2016, I was elected Attorney General, first time I'd ever run for anything. And I'm in that role, I'm the Chief Prosecutor in the state, the, the Chief Legal Officer in the state. And I opened an antitrust investigation against Facebook and Google, the first ones in, in the country. Wow. And it was because as I talked to parents, you know, I'm the father of, of three young children, two at the time, now we've got a third, Abigail, our baby girl. So my wife and I have three little ones at home. And as we went through the experience with our own kids with tech, you know, thinking about what platforms are our kids on? What are they exposed to? How do they mean track? As we talked to other parents, you know, and other parents would come to us and say, it's scary how these these tech companies know more about my kid than almost anybody else. They're tracked around the web. They build a dossier on my children. Like, what is going on here? (laughs) So that's kind of how I got into it. And then as attorney general, I I launched this antitrust investigation. It was like, wow. These guys are ruthless. They are monopolists. They are trying to control an entire segment. They're trying to control speech in America, essentially. That was the beginning of it for me. And so when I when I got elected to the Senate, you know, I, I just tried to bring that issue to the fore and say, this is this is a generational type issue because right. their power, the power these corporations have is more power than I think any, probably any company in America ever. But you got to at least go back a century to find something like it, and that's why I say. I mean, we've you remove the president of the United States, yeah, off platforms. I yeah. mean, it's actually unheard unbelievable. of. Unbelievable! It's unbelievable. And now, by the way, you know, Facebook had their their board decision or whatever it was a few weeks ago, in which the board, their review board, supposedly, in which the review, which is a joke, by the way, but the review board said Facebook didn't follow any of their own rules. 
They didn't have any procedures in place when they kicked Trump off Twitter. And Facebook was like, yeah, yeah of course. I mean, we'll just do what we want. You know? And that's how monopolist behaves, by the way. They right. do whatever they want. Right. It doesn't matter. They're not accountable. Right. So that's why we got to break them up. So what do we do? Like, what does the average American lover of Jesus, I mean, of course we can pray. We want to pray yep. that God would intervene, that he would use people like you. What do we do in the face of that? Because I feel like that issue right now is, it's, it's almost, it feels so big and so yeah. like an uphill battle. Yeah. What, what would be the takeaways for me? I think one of the things that we can do, and this is something that we've, we've had to work through as a family, my wife and I, is we can reclaim our homes and our family lives right. from tech. You know, right. so for me, you know, I say this, I'm wearing an Apple Watch. I mean, <laughs> when I come home, what do I do at night? I take this off, I put down my phone, I get off of the platforms. I don't bring that into my house, you know? Yeah. And so we, I, I, I learned really early on that one of the biggest infiltrators of tech and addiction, in terms of tech addiction in the house, was me. Because, you know, at one point I remember, Sean, I was, I was reading to my kids and I'm sitting on the bed and I'm reading the story and I've got, in this hand, I've got my phone and I realized that just even without thinking about it, I'm reading them and then and I'm looking at my phone. I'm like, what is going on here? Why am I looking at, why? I don't need my phone right now, you know? And what you realize is these tech companies, their business model is addiction. They want us addicted. Totally, they want totally. us on there constantly. Yeah. It's because they need to take our information from us. They right. need to sell us stuff. So we got to fight that addiction culture in our own homes right. by saying, I'm not going to bring it into the house. You know, with your kids, my kids are eight, six, and now six months. And, you know, for our older ones, eight and six, like, we don't really allow them to have screens. Uh, we certainly don't allow them to get onto social media to have yeah. platforms. And then we try to partner with other families who are similarly minded, you know, or like, ah, we don't want our kids carrying around phones and looking at them constantly. It's certainly not this age. So I think reclaiming your family life, setting up those guardrails, partnering with like-minded families, right. those might seem like small steps, but what you're doing is you're fighting that business model of addiction and you're denying it a foothold in your family. And I think that's big. That is big. What would you say to influencers or people that feel called, um, people that feel called to speak into those platforms? I mean, I feel yeah. like, you know, of course, I, I want to use the channels and the influence, whatever influence the Lord's given me, yep. right, to get out and promote the gospel. Yep. Some of that's events and, and just the things that we do and letting people know. Then there's another element where I want to be a voice in the midst of that. Right. But it also feels like, Sometimes you're just getting drowned out. Yeah, totally, you know? totally. Well, I, I think it's important that we have people who who want to speak into it. Right. Who, uh, because listen, I mean, I get asked all the time. You know, well, you're critical of the big tech companies, but you have a Facebook account, and you you know, and and you have a Twitter account. So why don't you shut that all down? And part of what I say is, listen, there are millions and millions of people right. there. That's what a monopoly is, right. by the way. There aren't alternatives, you know? I mean, right. it's like, that's what a monopoly is. Like they have, right. they have, you know, Facebook. There is no competitor to Facebook. Right. If you want to speak into that space, you have to use Facebook, but you can do it in a responsible way. And I would right. just say, we need people who want to get onto those platforms and engage in a healthy, constructive way and not become part of the addiction cycle. And right. I, I think that's the big thing is, don't become part of that clickbait addiction cycle where you, you start encouraging people to spend ever more time online, to right. be on there constantly, to whip up their emotions and, and division and hatred and anger, because all of that, you know, social media thrives on that. Totally. Because it keeps people online. So I think we need healthy, constructive voices yeah. who really want to do what social media was originally founded to do, which is connect people. Right. I often say at Facebook, if they really were about connecting people, there'd be no problem. But that's not what their that, business no, model is. No, that's totally. not what they're trying to do. Well, and if you look at, you know, the, the gospel, so... You know, when the upper room moment happened in Acts chapter 2, and then there was this commissioning, right? Yeah. You look at the, the reason why the gospel spread so fast and so quick was because the Roman road system was created, yeah. right? Now people go, oh, the Romans, nah, nah, nah. but it was a system was created. Jesus never said, don't take the Roman roads, yeah. you know, because the Romans are the evil, whatever. I mean, it's yeah. like, no, we're going to utilize this moment. God divine this moment. You know, and we experience that a lot, of course. We, you know, in our events, we live stream them everywhere, and sometimes it's a shaky phone where people get saved. Yeah, you know, yeah, across the world, you yeah. know, that can never go. So, the Lord can use that. I think that that, that we're we're caught in that area where how can we utilize it, these these tools, but yet not be consumed by them. Yeah, uh, I think that's exactly right. And there's, I don't think there's a formula for that. You yeah. know, I mean, you've got everybody's got to make uh, her or his own decision and and take it one step at a time. But I just I come back to. 
as we engage in healthy, constructive ways, right. don't become part of the cycle of addiction, don't become part of the cycle of clickbait and, and, and anger and hatred, and you know, don't, allow, don't encourage people to allow these tech companies and their platforms to dominate every aspect yeah. of their lives. Because yeah. that's what they want. The tech platforms want to be the totally. way that you communicate and live with the world such that you don't have friends apart from them, totally. that you don't have any kind yeah. of social life apart from them. Yeah. You know, we've got to reclaim our lives for ourselves. Come on. I'm with you on that. All right, last thing. So this is good. This is really good. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, this so is much. fun. So if so th there's a whole generation of people out there, you know, that I feel like that the Lord is inspiring to engage politically. Yeah. Right. Not just vote, of course, that that's like a duh. I mean, yeah. you're you're a citizen, you want to be a good citizen. Romans 13. Yeah. Vote, that's right? right? Yeah. Engage. Yeah. But there are people out there that I feel like the Lord is laying his hand on in this season to be raised up. Yeah. You know, and to engage. And it could be something like school board, joining the school board. It could be, you know, joining the city council. It could be whatever. Some people, the Lord's called and opened doors to do bigger things. Now, I tell everyone, you know, don't don't just run as a conservative in California for Congress. Like me, please, <laughs> I'll save you a lot of heartache. It's a difficult road. Um, but what is your, what would be your advice or your encouragement to people that have a desire to engage more in the political mouth? Oh, I would just say that we, we need believers and followers of Jesus to, to want to bring light and salt and truth into the political realm and to do that in a constructive mm -hmm. way. And I, I just think that, I think we need believers to, to prayerfully consider what can we do in this time right. to go and, and to, you know, the world, you look at how the world models um, political power. It's all about who's most important, right. who, who's on top, who can tell um, who what to do, who can use their power. I mean, right. we need a new generation of servant leaders who right. want to go and say, you know what? It's not about promoting my brand. It's not about making myself a big deal. It's right. about actually going and serving the people right. who I represent, you know, and right. serving those folks, right. working for their needs, right. promoting uh, their good, yeah. Uh, fighting for that. And, you know, I just think that, again, as believers in a country that we live in, because we are a democracy, you know, there's not much room for us to complain. If we don't engage, right. you know, then, then we really can't be heard to sit back and say, oh, well, I'm being mistreated. You know, right. uh, my rights are being taken away. Oh, I can't believe that, that uh, uh, things are going this way in our society. It's like, well, but what are we doing practically right. to get out yeah. there and to be forces for light and right. truth and good? So um, I, I just think we need, we need believers to sense the call. Here's the other thing I'd say, Sean. And I want to preface it by yeah. saying this before you say yeah. that. So a lot of people say, I want to do this because I have a word to do this. And I'm like, okay, but Josh went to Stanford, went to Yale. Like, I mean, you, he punched all the things. He did all the due diligence, probably didn't even want to ever be a senator. The Lord promoted him. There's a lot of work there too. Yeah. And 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 Christians can't have the mindset they're going to get one prophetic word and bypass all that. Yeah, you know? no, that's like, true. That's true. So I'm anyway, I just, I want yeah. people to understand that like, there's yeah. been a long road for you getting to where you are, and and it's it's, true. it's been one full of God. But although these days, I'm not sure they're going to Stanford and Yale is a great preparation for for politics these days. But anyway, <laughs> we talk about that another time. Those institutions. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I just I, I think that um, I, I think that in 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 this in this time and in this season, um, we just need folks who who see understand that, that politics is also a form of ministry. And what I was going to say right. is that Romans, I go back that. to Romans 13. Yeah, I love that. Interesting the word Paul uses there when he talks about government officials. He refers to them as ministers. Boy, that's, you know, that's a high calling. That's a serious right. thing. That ought, to, that ought to sober up anybody right. who is in any kind of office from whether it's wow. whether it's school that's board, powerful. which I think is probably one of the most important offices in America, right. to anything else. But, you know, the Lord says that, you are a minister because he has a particular role for government. Right. He's given us government to work yeah. for the common good, to protect people of whatever their faith backgrounds, by the way, whether they know him, don't know him. He's given us government as a grace, as a good. And he said that people who serve in government are, are my ministers. And I think we need a new generation that sees that, sees public service as a form of That's ministry. Good. You I know, really and feels like, that. okay, yeah. I'm, I'm called to this. This is a form of ministry. Right. And, um, and by the way, it doesn't, you know, people all the time say to me, oh, well, you, you're, you're talking about theocracy. You're saying that the government is, and the church are going to be melded. That's not what I'm saying. What we believe as Christians is the Lord has his church. The Lord gives government separately. He has a particular mandate for government. And part of what government does is it serves and it protects and it works for the good of all people, whether right. they know him or not. 
And one of the main ways it does it is it protects that right of conscience where people yeah. can respond to the call of God on their lives as they're led. But that's a unique call, and I think we should help Christians discern that and say, do you feel like you're called to that or not? Right. That's really, really good. That's so good. What is one hopeful thing you could leave, leave us with about what you're seeing in government? I, I just think this would be a really good, good takeaway in this season. Yeah. You're in those meetings every day. You're in the chamber. You're with the, you know, yeah. the senators. You're before the president. You're, 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 you're in the midst of all of it. And I yeah. mean, I know that there's a lot going on. We don't get always the most uplifting news from the right or left. Yeah. It's just not a no. lot of good news. No. So give us a little bit of hope on what you see happening this year. Well, what I, I tell you one of the things I think is most hopeful is, is actually not happening in Washington, but it's happening at home back in my state of Missouri and in the places I get to visit. I think you see Americans who are saying, you know what, we are tired of the media narrative that we are a deeply divided, hopelessly, uh, uh, divided country full of hate and anger. Right. That just isn't true. Right. That's not how we live in our neighborhoods. Totally. That's not how we live in our lives. I would, I would, I would agree. You know, you're seeing this, right? I think that is so, I think that's so hopeful. Here's my view, Sean, is that I think the American people, you know, the American people get a bad rap. In the media, they're portrayed, especially if they're working people, they're portrayed all the time as like, oh, you know, they all of these pathologies and all of these addictions and all of these, you know, issues with, with uh, uh, divorce and family breakdown and all of the loss of jobs and da 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 it's like, but you know what? If you actually go and you talk to Americans, you'll find the real strength of our country is there. The right. real faith and hope is there. Right. I think the American people are a strong people. They are a great people. They are a hopeful people. The problem isn't there. The problem is with the leadership class right. in this country over, over some generations now. Right. So my hope right. is, is I am at home, totally. and as I'm seeing people, what I'm seeing people say is, you know, we're going to live lives where we reach out to our neighbors, where we rebuild these communities, where we help those who are suffering, where we pursue racial reconciliation, where we do those things and we love one another. And that's, that's, the, that's what's really happening. That's the real America. Well, thanks so much, Josh. That Thank was you. amazing. Thanks Thank for you. taking the time. We're, we so appreciate you. Thank we appreciate you. everything you're doing. We're gonna be praying for you, standing with you, holding the line. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you.